moral relativism. Uh, it's, a, it's a little difficult to discuss. It's a little bit like discussing skepticism. Uh, there, there are no skeptics. Uh, you can discuss it in a philosophy seminar, but no human being can, in fact, be a skeptic. They wouldn't survive for two minutes if they were, so they're not. And I think pretty much the same is true of moral relativism. Uh, there are no moral relativists. There are people who profess it. You can discuss it abstractly, but it it doesn't exist in ordinary life. Uh, and to sharpen the discussion a little, we should recognize that the concept moral relativism ranges over quite a broad spectrum. So there's a form of moral relativism, which is uh, totally uncontroversial. Of course, it's true. Now, there are, as uh, to quote this, there are uh, ethical norms that vary widely over space and time. I mean, that's a, just an observation of fact. Nobody denies that. Now, similarly, uh, every other aspect of humans varies quite widely. So, for example, human visual systems can vary quite widely in the way they uh, function, depending on early experience. Actually, it's been shown by experiment, not with humans, but with uh, other animals with essentially the same visual system, that you can change, uh, you can change them radically just by uh, early experience. Uh, every biological system, and I assume we're biological organisms, so our moral values and ethical systems are also biological systems. Uh, every one of them can vary quite widely uh, depending on uh, experience. But that's not controversial. Uh, so, for example, the human visual system can be varied experimentally so that it will uh, uh, have different, different distributions of receptors that uh, uh, respond to horizontal and vertical lines, and that'll give very different perception. You can show it with cats and monkeys. We have the same visual system. On the other hand, you can't turn a human visual system into a, an insect visual system as you change experience. And this is quite general across the biological domain, including moral systems. Uh, there are, there's a range of options that's possible. There's variation within that range, but there are also limits to the range. And in fact, this takes us to the, there's a tendency to move from the uncontroversial concept of moral relativism to a concept that is, in fact, uh, incoherent. And that's to say that moral values can range indefinitely. That belief, which is held, is literally incoherent. It's based on the assumption that moral values um, reflect culture. But then that raises the next question. How does a person acquire how does a person acquire its, uh, that his or her culture? I mean, you don't get it by taking a pill. Uh, you get your culture, you acquire your culture by observing a rather limited uh, number of uh, uh, behaviors and actions, and from those constructing somehow in your mind uh, the set of attitudes and beliefs that uh, constitute your culture. But that act is very much like uh, learning a language or like uh, developing a visual system, or in fact, like finding a scientific theory. It's a matter of making a great leap from scattered data to some outcome. And that leap is made essentially the same way by all individuals, a given relatively fixed experience. And it's only possible if you have uh, extensive built-in innate structure, it just as you can develop a human rather than an insect visual system only if it's guided by genetic instructions, very specific ones. The same is true of acquisition of language, of uh, acquisition of arithmetical capacity, uh, acquisition of a culture, hence acquisition of moral values. But that means that the most extreme form of moral relativism is actually uh, committed to the belief in universal values namely those that set the frame in which uh, this a tremendous leap from uh, uh, data, scattered data, to uh, uh, a complex, uh, relatively fixed uh, system can take place. Now, that's why the extreme version of moral relativism, which is common, and I think Foucault professed it, uh, 
is simply incoherent. Uh, if you adopt that position, you are committed to uh, far-reaching universal values and their existence. Those that, just as if you uh, are studying the visual system and you discover that it can vary over a wide range, you're nevertheless, in fact, by that very fact, uh, committed to the belief that there are fixed uh, innate genetically determined constraints that set the framework in which it can develop and that sort of guide the development of the f of the structure even though allowing a certain degree of variation and in fact i think that the i, I won't talk about postmodernism that's beyond my capacity to discuss but just keep the postmodernism which at least has the merit of being incoherent i'm not sure that uh, postmodernism even reaches that far but uh, it reminds me of a famous comment of a physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, who was apparently a pretty acid person and used to say sometimes uh, when someone proposed something, that's not even false. You know, didn't get that far. But uh, the, uh, uh, take these examples, uh, slavery, subjugation of women, repression of homosexuals, and let's forget about a variety of cultures. Just think about our own. Uh, in our own culture, uh, not that far back, uh, these were all perfectly accepted norms. So it takes a uh, uh, repression of homosexuals. Uh, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, uh, Alan Turing, uh, who also was a war hero in Britain, he's one of the people who uh, really saved uh, Britain from the uh, German uh, uh, assault. He, was instrumental in uh, developing the techniques that uh, decoded the uh, German signals so the British were able to determine where the bombers were going to hit and so on and so forth. Uh, he was uh, killed by the British government uh, by a forced treatment to cure his disease of homosexuality. Well, that wasn't that long ago. I mean, that wasn't when I was a graduate student. You know, it doesn't seem very long ago to me. Uh, that's inconceivable now, you know, totally inconceivable. Uh, moral values have uh, uh, advanced. I would say that what it means is that we have penetrated more deeply into our own actual moral values and seen as the moral sphere extends that some things that were uh, considered completely normal and uh, admirable are so atrocious you can't even think about them. And the same is true of uh, slavery. Uh, subjugation of women is very uh, recently overcome, a long way to go yet, but uh, ch changed dramatically in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, as I mentioned, beginning just with uh, consciousness raising groups that uh, brought women to recognize that what they took to be normal and necessary uh, and even and acceptable is in fact uh, a completely uh, uh, a should be totally rejected. Okay, that's the same thing, widening of the moral sphere. The same is true of slavery a little bit earlier. Uh, there still are slaves, uh, estimated 30 million or so in the world, but uh, it's regarded as uh, reprehensible and totally unacceptable. And in fact, if you look at the history of uh, uh, overcoming of slavery in the West, it was substantially moral arguments. Uh, incidentally, it's not that the slave owners had no arguments. Uh, they did. And it's worth attending to those arguments. In fact, some of them really have never been answered. And the fact that they're not answered gives us some insight. Uh, it's always, uh, in fact, in general, contrary to the views of the extreme moral relativists, relativists uh, moral dis disagreements can be debated. You don't just have to scream at each other. Uh, you can look at the arguments, try to find some common ground, uh, work from the common ground and try to reach a conclusion. That's a uh, moral uh, interchange, and it's often successful. So I think slavery. Uh, one of the arguments during the American Civil War of the slave owners, which is a serious argument, is that they argued that they are more moral than northern industrialists uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, they own their workers and therefore they take care of them. Uh, just as if you own a car, you'll take care of it. Uh, Northern industrialists rent their workers uh, and they don't take care of them. They have no responsibility for them. 
uh, just as if you rent a car, you probably won't take care of it. Uh, so therefore, slavery is more moral than uh, uh, than uh, a capitalist uh, industrial policy. Actually, I think there's some merit to that argument. But instead of concluding from it that safe slavery is legitimate, uh, we should conclude what the uh, working people in the North in the a century and a half ago, uh, we should draw their conclusion. It was a very common belief among working people in the, the United States that wage labor is fundamentally no different from slavery. Uh, the only difference is it's temporary. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, that was such a popular view that it was a slogan of the Republican Party. Uh, it was uh, Abraham Lincoln's view. Uh, you, you could read it in the New York Times. Uh, it's taken a long time to drive that understanding out of people's heads. And I don't think it's driven very far. I think it's right below the surface. And it continually comes out. And so just to comment on this idea about regimes of truth, uh, I suspect we're going to agree about this. But I mean, I think Foucault, Foucault wildly exaggerates. Again, there's a kind of a truism, which is not controversial, that... Uh, Power systems have some effect on uh, the way the scientific work proceeds and can be accepted and so on. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, at the extreme, it's a, a Stalinist biology. Okay, that had an effect. Uh, there's corporate uh, influences on how drug trials are conducted. Uh, that's true. There are professional rest- uh, uh, constraints. Actually, I've lived through them in my entire life. I, when I started my own professional work, I couldn't publish because it was too inconsistent with accepted ideas. In fact, the first book I wrote in 1955, it didn't come out for 20 years. And it came out then, it was submitted, but rejected. It came in, out later just as kind of like a, for historical interest, but then field and developed had grown. So sure, that happens, but it's marginal. And there are self-correcting procedures in the sciences uh, which work pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well. So there is an element of, uh, you know, power relations that enter into, uh, say, scientific work. But uh, to talk about regimes of power, it seems to me uh, radically overstating the case. The real question is whether you can regard these differences within a framework of progress in the sense that some cultures or features of culture are better than others. I mean, the real question of of cultural relativism is is one whether you think progress implies, as you said, an an, an underlying innate sense, for instance, a sense of justice, or whether these uh, cultural choices are wholly arbitrary with none being better than it. But, I mean, that's the real issue with cultural relativism. But whatever you believe about that, there is a fixed basis. There must be a fixed basis. Otherwise, you can't acquire a culture in the first place. And that fixed basis has to be determinative, narrowly determinative. Now, that fixed basis gives our actual human uh, uh, moral values. Now, if you take a, if you raise the question about progress, yeah, I think there is progress, and I think it's valuable to look at our own history. So we're not talking about uh, imperialist conquest. Our own history shows uh, that there is moral progress, and in fact, the very examples that were given strongly illustrated slavery, subjugation of women, repression of homosexuals. All of this was in very common, perfectly well accepted in Western culture, not very far back. Uh, In the case of, say, Turing, it was 50 years ago. It's now all regarded as uh, completely unacceptable. I think that's evidence, you know, it's not, in human, uh, discussing human affairs, you don't have proofs, we don't understand enough. But I think this is, uh, and there's much more like it, is evidence that uh, somehow, uh, as our own uh, uh, history, uh, culture develops, we penetrate more deeply into our actual, real, uh, cultural and norm, um, normative values. And uh, we expand the moral sphere to, in fairly definite ways. Uh, these three examples are, uh, are good illustrations of it. There are plenty like it, Jim. Yeah.
I would like to respond to that because you see, this is exactly what you're expressing there is exactly the point of view of the enlightenment, which is so rejected nowadays in the name of other cultures. Because if you, you, you speak of progress without our own cultures and you say this took a long time, etc., etc., and now we look at it as a progress. But when you encounter other cultures that have not undergone this so-called progress, they will reply to you that your progress is actually a regression. Let me give you an example. Take homosexuality. Suppose there is a sacred book, a religious book, that says that this is a sin. If you allow that sin, the community will be destroyed, partly because to allow that sin is to allow for unreligious behavior and to allow for skepticism. And if skepticism spreads, then the religious culture is going to be destroyed. I have seen that in my own country, in my own life, with the Catholic culture. Right. Uh, now wait, wait, wait. You, yeah, I know. But suppose a Muslim doesn't want to see their culture going the same way the Catholic has in this country, or the Jews, or some other sort of more traditional community, or the Catholic, whatever remains of them. I mean, you see, what do you say to them? You say your whole culture should go because homosexuality mm -hmm. should be free? In fact, that I say the same thing in my own culture. It's it's, yeah. a, it's a sin in Jewish culture. Yeah, I know. Okay, but uh, but then don't that you think it's been no, it's a sin in Jewish culture? I wouldn't have uh, asked some uh, Nazi to come along and force force it to be abandoned. No, but I think that in the course of time, in the course of thinking through your own values, uh, these things are overcome. Our own culture is a good example. Uh, okay. Homosexuality was considered not a sin; it was considered a pathology, a yeah, sickness. I know. I know. Okay, and that's recent. Uh, we've come to understand it's not a sickness, and in fact, ah. the idea that it was and that you should kill people. Yeah, as yeah in, I know, but you okay. think this understanding is universal? Should be is potentially universal? Should it apply I, all cultures? I think it's even those potentially universal, and I think there are good reasons to believe it, because even if you're the most extreme moral relativist. You are presupposing universal moral values, mm. uh, no. and those can be discovered. In fact, in the recent years, there's even empirical work uh, trying to investigate them across culturally uh, with children and so on. It was basically a scientific question, uh, and we know that there's we have good reason to expect that there's going to be an answer. Uh, part of the reason is just almost logic: uh, you can't acquire a culture. Uh, without having a rich, in, uh, built-in uh, array of uh, constraints that allow the leap from scattered data to whatever it is that you acquire. I mean, that's virtually logic. And I think a look at our own history gives good illustrations. Uh, for example, looking at just the very examples that are given here, it's been a long battle, uh, but over time, in fact, the last couple of centuries, there's been a very consistent change, and the change is uh, not without conflict, uh, but it's uh, going in a particular direction, and I think you can even understand the direction. The direction is towards uh, more tolerance of variation uh, and, uh, and more opposition to uh, uh, coercion and control. I think that's a very definite tendency, and I think it 